Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here for the final session of, of all of ConsulCon. Um, very grateful for you for staying and grateful for these amazing presenters here. Um, this is a session about different types and experiments in participation. Uh, we have uh, one person who's going to be talking about um, using console uh, in a very particular context. Um, but we have folks talking about other experiments in participation that aren't related to console and, and trying to learn from each other and sharing what's been working, uh, in what context, and what the challenges might be and how we can learn from that. Um, we're going to start with uh, a presentation from Marion about uh, using console, just recently starting console in the Basque region in high school. Um, and then we're going to go from there to neighborhoods with Thomas, who's going to talk to us about uh, work in um, uh, some particular neighborhoods in Berlin. Uh, Andreas, Andreas? Yep. yep, is going to be sharing information about, at a next level, using uh, participation to discuss Brexit. And Hey Young is going to be sharing uh, a project using an online platform for participation in South Korea that led to drastic changes in the entire country's government. <laughs> so I'll have them introduce themselves as well. Soy María Muguerza, directora de un instituto de enseñanza media en Guecho, en Vizcaya, en el País Vasco. Y he venido a contar eh, lo que estamos haciendo en el instituto con Consul. ¿De acuerdo? Nuestro proyecto se llama Nikerabaki. Esto es eh, en euskera, está en vasco. Y significa yo decido. ¿De acuerdo? A ver. ¿Este mejor? ¿Sí? ¿Y ahora esto no pasa? Bien. Eh, he puesto arriba, en, en casi todas las diapositivas... Eh, lo he puesto primero en euskera. Nuestro centro es un centro en el que eh, todo, todas las asignaturas, todo el currículum es en euskera, salvo una asignatura de lengua española. Y, lógicamente, es nuestra sedia de identidad y, y así lo hemos querido reflejar, tanto en el nombre del proyecto como en estas diapositivas que tienen primero en, en euskera, en vasco, el, el, el lema y luego en castellano. ¿De acuerdo? Bien. Entonces, nosotros, una vez conocidas la, las posibilidades de la plataforma Consul, se nos abrió el cielo. Es decir, eh, vimos una herramienta eh, sencilla eh, para implementarla y, y que iba a potenciar, no solo en potenciar, un poquito más adelante lo diré, sino que iba a iniciar eh, la participación de toda la comunidad escolar en las decisiones que tomábamos en el centro. Eh, cosa que era muy difícil o era en ocasiones y en otras ocasiones era minoritaria. Entonces nosotros, a través de Consul, hemos eh, diseñado un, pre, un proyecto de participación en tres fases, por trimestres académicos. En el primer trimestre académico, que terminará para nosotros en diciembre, eh, estamos con los presupuestos participativos. Esto ha sido lo primero que hemos iniciado. Después, eh, en el segundo trimestre, eh, haremos, comenzaremos un debate sobre cuestiones organizativas que implican a todo el centro. En, eh, estos presupuestos participativos solo participan el alumnado. En esta segunda fase, en los debates sobre las decisiones organizativas, queremos que participe el alumnado, el profesorado y también las familias. ¿de acuerdo? Y luego ya, en el tercer y último trimestre del curso, queremos eh, hacer ciertas consultas, los profesores queremos hacer ciertas consultas a los alumnos para saber qué, qué cuestiones didácticas eh, en nosotros son mejorables. ¿no? Bien, ¿cómo lo hemos hecho? Eh, en un principio, evidentemente, cuando comenzó el curso en septiembre no teníamos la plataforma montada, pero queríamos empezar a moverlo porque queríamos que, que, que eh, el primer trimestre fuera el de los proyectos participativos. Así que eh, hicimos una campaña de difusión del proyecto, pero mmm, sin, sin cónsul. Eh, los eh, profesores tutores eh, se acercaban a los alumnos, les contaban en qué iba a consistir y el, tanto el debate como las propuestas eh, se hacían cara a cara y las propuestas por escrito. ¿no? Sí que les dijimos que estábamos preparando una plataforma y que eso mismo que estaban haciendo cara a cara, eh, después de alguna forma podrían hacerlo con su teléfono móvil desde casa o cuando ellos quisieran. Eh, claro, cuando vimos la primera vez eh, la interface de, de Consul, nos dimos cuenta que está creado para lo que está creado, para la participación ciudadana, lógicamente, y había muchas cuestiones que no nos encajaban. Eh, bueno, 
poco a poco hemos ido descubriendo, menú tras menú, ¿no? dónde cambiar ciudadano por alumno o por alumna, y ciudad por comunidad escolar, etc. ¿De acuerdo? Entonces, hemos ido eh, adaptando o adecuando el entorno de cónsul a nuestro entorno educativo. No, no voy a mostrar ahora la página web, que está en este enlace, termino la exposición y si después me quedan un par de minutillos ya, eh, os muestro cómo es eh, nuestro, nuestro cónsul. ¿no? Bien, he hablado de que en este primer trimestre estábamos con los presupuestos participativos y ya he dicho que primero lo hicimos de forma presencial. Eh, aquí también tengo un vídeo de, que, que ellos mismos hicieron, que los alumnos y las alumnas hicieron cuando hacían estos debates en clase. ¿no? Eh, el proceso siempre era eh, a base de reuniones. Eh, la directiva se reunió primero, después nos, re, nos reunimos con todos los profesores tutores, los profesores tutores se reunían con su grupo semanalmente, los delegados de cada clase se reunían también entre ellos y luego se reunían con nosotros y... Eh, pasado un mes de estos debates cara a cara, ya pudimos eh, comenzar con el debate de cónsul. Claro, cuando se, mmm, lo que hemos podido ver de cónsul en las ciudades, ¿no? cuando se consulta a las ciudades, se consulta a todos los ciudadanos y a todas las ciudadanas. Pero mmm, nos planteamos que eh, en la, ante la comunidad escolar, nuestros alumnos y alumnas tienen entre 12 y 17, 18 años. En la comunidad escolar nos pareció más adecuado organizar por lo menos los debates por niveles. Y entonces eh, preferimos que los de primero de secundaria debatiesen entre ellos y así sucesivamente, segundo, tercero, cuarto, primero y segundo de bachiller. Eh, lógicamente no es la misma mentalidad la de un alumno o una alumna de 12 años que la de uno de, de 17. ¿no? Después las propuestas son todas comunes y la votación también es para todos. Solo los debates es lo que hemos pensado hacer por niveles. Bien. Eh, Insistiendo, comenzó el debate por niveles ¿no? y al principio iba muy lento. ¿de acuerdo? En, las, en los debates cara a cara estaba siempre la figura del profesor tutor que eh, pinchaba, animaba, hacía hablar al que no hablaba. Pero claro, una vez que se quedan solos tras el, el, tras el ordenador o tras la, el, el teléfono, el que no quiere hablar no habla. Entonces, ¿cómo haces que todos participen? Entonces, nos dimos cuenta que, además de la figura del moderador o del administrador, que podía darles feedback también a través de los comentarios, necesitábamos una figura intermedia que sería, le hemos llamado el animador. Es decir, un profesor o profesora, independientemente de su asignatura, que comenta en la clase, sea cual sea esta, eh, el proyecto. Les pregunta por su, sus intereses, les hace ver la necesidad de que las propuestas que se hagan eh, sean cuestiones que interesen a, a toda la comunidad escolar, que uno no puede pedir que le den, como piden eh, los de bachillerato, por ejemplo, eh, talleres de educación sexual adecuados a su edad, ¿no? solo para los mayores. Es decir, lo que se plantea a través de los presupuestos participativos tiene que ser algo que sea para toda la comunidad, que sea para todos ellos, desde los 12 hasta los 18 años. ¿no? Y entonces, esta figura del animador nos ha dado muy buen resultado. Eh, la, las propuestas, la, el debate ha empezado realmente a moverse una vez que esta figura eh, empezó a tener importancia. ¿no? Bien, <coughs> tenemos, ya, ya he dicho antes, dos fases pendientes, porque hemos he comentado que los íbamos a hacer en tres fases. Si alguno entra o si nos da tiempo a, vista, a, le iba a decir en euskera, eh, si nos da tiempo a ver la plataforma, eh, la, eh, el primer trimestre los presupuestos participativos lo tenemos solo puesto en euskera. Ya he comentado al principio que en, en nuestro centro mm, solo, solo se maneja en euskera como lengua vehicular. ¿no? Eh, en el segundo trimestre pensamos, como pensamos, incluir a las familias, eh, ponerlo ya en, en castellano, porque es, sí, to, no todas las familias son eh, euskaldunak, no son hablantes de, de, de euskera o de vasco. Y en el tercer trimestre, ya que nuestro centro también es trilingüe, pensamos ponerlo en inglés. Bien, entonces las fases pendientes son estas dos que quedan. Ya los he comentado antes, es repetirlo sobre lo mismo. El debate sobre las decisiones organizativas que implican al centro, por ejemplo, horarios, ¿no? Pensamos consultar sobre si el alumnado y las familias quieren horario continuo o horario partido, en el País Vasco tenemos horario partido, por ejemplo, y luego, ya he dicho, en el tercer trimestre, las consultas sobre cuestiones mejorables. Vale, voy a toda prisa. ¿Qué hemos conseguido? Bien, abrir la vida del debate, que es importante, 
implicar al alumnado en todas las decisiones del centro y, curiosamente, hemos conseguido algo que no esperábamos, pero lo hemos, vi lo hemos visto desarrollado a lo largo de estos días de debate, ¿no? que es visibilizar a las alumnas. Eh, de cada diez alumnos que hacen una propuesta o que entran en el debate, ocho son chicas. Y esto nos ha dado eh, mucho que pensar ¿no? y, y, y de alguna forma en nuestro centro que también tiene un gran proyecto de, de, de esquirecha que se llama de coeducación, eh, está muy agradecido a este tipo de, de estudios y de conclusiones. Bien, ¿qué queremos conseguir en lo que nos queda? Seguir promoviendo la participación que hasta ahora era casi inexistente, era mínima, un representante, dos en los consejos escolares, siempre delante de los adultos, los pobres no abrían la boca, ¿no?, eh, y luego, esta idea de que hay que aprender ¿no? mientras se actúa y que la mejor manera de aprender es actuar sobre las necesidades reales del entorno con, con la finalidad de poder mejorarlo. Esto es lo que queremos enseñarles. Y, por supuesto, implicarlos eh, a todos los niveles en la toma de decisiones del centro para que el centro sea de todos y no solo del profesorado. Y, en fin… Muchas gracias. Aquí tenéis mi contacto, el, el correo electrónico de la dirección, de la directora que soy yo en este caso, y el teléfono. Lo único que queremos es que esto se extienda. Cuanto más se extienda, más difícil será de volver atrás. ¿no? Yo pensaba que éramos más los centros escolares que habíamos implementado esto. Aquí me, sorprendido, me ha sorprendido ver que no, que son muy pocos o, o, o no hay más. Y en Madrid sí que pensaba encontrarme alguno y me hubiera gustado ir o conocerlo, pero parece ser que tampoco hay. Así que, amigas, amigos, hay que ponerse las pilas. Esto es importante, los ciudadanos no nacen como los hongos cuando llueve tras la lluvia, hay que formarlos. Y nos preocupamos mucho de los ciudadanos, nos preocupamos de la infancia, pero ahí hay una especie de bolsa entre los 12 y los 17 años, que es un, es un, un núcleo importante de futuros ciudadanos a los que formar. Muchas gracias. Yes. Oh, that's very loud. So everybody wakes up. Um, buenas tardes. I will speak in English, but uh, first of all, I want to uh, tell you a little story about how I how it comes that I'm here at this conference. A long time ago, I made a stage in the Ayuntamiento de Valencia, and there was no culture of citizen participation at all. And um, two years ago, I went again to Valencia and, and I saw how much things have changed about citizen participation and so on. And I went on my trip here in Madrid. I knocked on the door at the Ayuntamiento and asked, what are you doing about citizen participation? And they said to me, we don't have time today, but you come tomorrow. And so that was the story I met Miguel and I met a lot of other guys and therefore I'm here and I will tell you what we are doing about citizen participation in a specific neighborhood in Berlin. It's, it's a very famous neighborhood for the moment because it's very popular among young people so everybody who owns a Lonely Planet tourist guide, he will be led to the district of Neukölln but there are a lot of other things. Um, Yes. Uh, first of all, there is a regeneration program in all cities, or nearly all cities, which have disadvantaged neighborhoods in Berlin. And this is a very unique uh, issue, because nowadays, in less and less European countries, you have such an approach. We are also in contact with colleagues in the United Kingdom, and they were telling about horrible stories about austerity politics. So we still have such a program, and in Berlin, all these neighborhoods are selected, like here in Berlin, by a sophisticated system about monitoring, and the um, orange and pink areas, these are the areas in need we have in Berlin. Uh, what is neighborhood management? What is our integrated approach? We have a neighborhood management team in every 
one of the 34 areas in Berlin. It is an interdisciplinary team. There are always people from ethnic minorities included. We have a local office. There is a compulsory participation concept for different target groups. A neighborhood council, which is very unique for the program Social Integrative City. There are workshops, conferences, civic involvement, self-organization. There is a sophisticated funding structure, fields of action, and what is quite important, we have heard today about long-term strategy. There is an integrated action and development plan for it. This is how the uh, neighborhood councils are composed. It's um, important that the majority consists of local residents, but it's also important to include the other stakeholders in this neighborhood council, and they decide on the strategy and on the money. There we have also a digital government platform for civic participation in Berlin called MyBerlin.de, Mein Berlin. It's a little bit different from console, and, and I don't know all the details, but you see there is a toolbox where you have brainstorming, map support, agenda setting, public comment, participatory budget survey, prioritization of topics, of places, and also what is very specific, legally binding land use plans, which are also uh, this toolbox is used for. But the main problem is, you see it in the next slide, it's only used by 5,000 inhabitants. The normal age is uh, 47 years. Three of four households have an academic degree, and these are mainly inhabitants of the inner city district. So you see the problem that it's not really representative. Some statistic about the neighborhood I'm working in, uh, we have nearly 9,000 inhabitants. We have had a large population growth during the last years without any new housing. The migration, migrant population is around 60%. Child poverty is also quite high, it's above 66%. And people who are dependent on social benefits is above 30%. Some of the key elements of the concept of citizen participation, and it, it not only consists on the decision on the budget, it consists on information, deciding on the strategy, the budget, we have specific tools for reaching different target groups, and we are involving the people in the projects we are realizing. These are some examples of our information. We have an office to talk face-to-face -to, -face to the local residents. We still have a newspaper, even if we are not allowed to, by the Senate Department, but we, we are still producing it. Um, we are discussing the... Um, strategy and we are using other techniques like graphic recording to making it more visible because a normal resident wouldn't read a 100 page a strategic paper. There you find as well the funding structure we have. We have an action fund of up to 1,500 euros so everybody who wants to realize a project in the neighborhood can do it immediately. Then we have a project fund which is uh, which consists of 200,000 euros for projects for more than 5,000 euros and which, um, which you can fund projects for up to three years. And for all these bigger investments, there's also the commitment by the district administration that they only uh, will realize these projects which are supported by the local residents or the neighborhood council. And there is also a network fund because we cannot find all the solution in one neighborhood, so we are working together with other neighborhood management teams in a so-called network fund, and also with the different departments in the city of Berlin. This is our um, neighborhood uh, council. It consists mainly half of men, of women, uh, of different ethnic backgrounds, and we have uh, the prerequisite that 50% of all uh, participants in the neighborhood council have to have a non-German background. We are also using uh, new uh, approaches uh, concerning different uh, milieus. 
this is how we interact even in the real life with um, the local residents on festivals. This is our digital agenda and I will, I will finish with the future task we have. One task will be connecting citywide online participation platforms with our local approaches because there is this digital agenda in Berlin and there are all the strategies about smart cities but normally the disadvantaged areas don't play any role in this strate uh, strategic considerations of the city. How can we combine analog and digital tools, tools to engage and empower different social and ethnic groups? From our point of view, trust can be only built by humans. And this is the last word. Um, our main task is as well transforming the public infrastructure to facilitate citizen particip participation. Because up to now, we don't have in every school computers, laptops, uh, wireless LAN, and so on. So this is also a very different difficult task to make it possible that everybody can um, use this tool of participation he wants to use. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks so much. So now we go from a neighborhood level to looking at um, a participation process in the UK after the Brexit uh, decision was made. Um, Andreas, tell us what Involve UK has done. Yep. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is um, Andreas Pavlou. I am the network lead at Involve, which is a public participation charity based in the UK. Uh, we run projects, we run engagement projects uh, with government, with parliament, with uh, local authorities to uh, bring people into the decision making process. And we also run innovative projects where we try to demonstrate the uh, value of deliberative methods as a way to overcome often complex, um, controversial, or what's often considered to be impossible to solve uh, problems where politicians or elected officials aren't necessarily able to, to, to agree. So that's the kind of thing that we do. It's not um, tech, it's not um, digital in many ways. Uh, we do use some digital tools, but very basic ones. Uh, and it's all about getting people to sit around a table and to chat and to uh, find common ground and to come to kind of common understandings of the issues that uh, affect their lives. So we thought to ourselves last year, what's a really complicated issue in the UK uh, where people are polarized, where people cannot agree, where there seems to be no obvious answer and where it just seems helpless and hopeless. We got this group of people together, a representative sample of the UK public, um, to talk about the issue of Brexit. Uh, obviously in the UK it's a little bit complicated to, to find people who might agree on Brexit, uh, in any, whether they both remain, both uh, leave, uh, either side or any shape or form of what Brexit might look like. So what we did is uh, we brought together um, 50 members of the public. Uh, these guys, to uh, talk about recommendations and provide recommendations for uh, post-Brexit policy. So we took, for, we took the result as a given. We're not going to redo the referendum discussion, which was just uh, uh, not necessarily a great way to do politics in the UK. And we decided, okay, so if we're going to leave the EU, what should our trade look like with the EU and what should our migration policy and other of the main issues around uh, the Brexit referendum look like. We um, got in contact with a, we were doing this with uh, King's College London and uh, we got 5,000 people, well we asked them whether they would be interested in such a uh, citizens assembly and we basically were able to whittle that down to 50 people. So those 50 people were a representative sample of the UK public, socioeconomic, male, female, um, regional, like geographic um, representation of the different countries and regions of England and the rest of the UK. And um, importantly, we made sure that the 
people who were going to be part of the Citizens' Assembly were representative of the vote as well. So we had more people participating who wanted to leave the EU than those who wanted to remain in the EU, as was the referendum result. We, um, we provided an honorarium for people as well, so that, they, um, so that we could make sure that we could get people from lower incomes to participate also. Hello. Oops, sorry. <laughs> uh, so we held two weekends. Uh, over two weekends, we got people to discuss on the first weekend. Um, they listened, sorry, to sorry. They listened to experts about the issue. They uh, read briefing papers on the various topics of migration and trade uh, with the EU. They were able to um, ask questions to the various uh, experts that were in the room, and we made sure that we had experts who were both for leaving the EU and those who wanted a closer relationship with the EU, so that we could um, bridge that breadth of uh, debate. We then um, ensured that the briefing papers were also as neutral as possible, if you can call them neutral, by having an advisory board which again had experts from both pro-leave and pro-remain so that they could um, agree on the text that people were being given so that they could understand they had kind of uh, uh, impartial or, or neutral information about the issues that they were going to discuss. In the second weekend, we um, got people around the table. We got people to deliberate, to discuss the issues, to um, think about the recommendations that they were going to give uh, or make around the issues of trade and uh, migration policy. Um, there we go. So if we go here, and I'm sure people would probably be interested. I see the graphic. Look. Um, I'm going to, okay, very quickly go over some of the results that people um, came up with. Um, uh, so, uh, we asked people firstly what they think the UK policy objectives should be for um, negotiating on trade. So, people talked about things like minimizing harm to the economy, maintaining living standards, protecting workers' rights. Uh, avoiding a hard border with Northern Ireland, uh, with Ireland even, all the issues which basically right now if you look at the UK news are not necessarily the ones which are being uh, prioritised by the UK government in the way that it's going about um, negotiations. Then we looked at, or then we asked people to look at the priorities for migration policy and again uh, things about benefiting the economy, uh, better planning of public services for immigration, um, and making sure that, for example, uh, there's better data on who is coming into the country, etc. Then we looked and gave people options to choose from. Uh, on the issue of trade, for example, we got, had issues, well, we had four options from staying in the single market to having a comprehensive trade deal, a limited trade deal, and no trade deal. So that kind of range of options that, they could, that the UK government could pursue. We asked them to vote after having these deliberations, and in terms of people's first preference, people of the majority, want, well, the, the plural majority at least, wanted a, a limited trade deal of some kind, and no trade deal was obviously the, less, uh, the least uh, preferable. We then took people's preferences over if they couldn't have one or the other, what would they prefer? And again, having a trade deal, whether it be comprehensive or limited, was the, was the option that people preferred. If they couldn't get a comprehensive deal, something was better than nothing. And again, if they couldn't have any, if we couldn't get any trade deal with the EU, then people preferred having remain in the single market as opposed to a trade deal, uh, as opposed to having no trade deal with the EU. Then um, I'll skip this bit and go to migration. Again, from having free movement of labour all the way to having uh, basically the same rules for EU and non-EU citizens with lower levels of, of immigration than current. Having had deliberation and talked about it, people preferred by far having the option of free movement but using the controls that already exist within the EU, which is very different to the debate that we've been having in the UK um, with, by politicians. And again, uh, the free movement using controls was most popular after um, 
preferences as well. So there's more on this. You can look at citizensassembly.co.uk and basically it was a great example of showing how something which is really difficult can um, actually be uh, uh, deliberated by regular citizens, by normal people to come to a kind of more nuanced public uh, understanding of the issues and give a public opinion that's more nuanced. And in a way, this kind of deliberation and this kind of uh, participation can help to strengthen representative democracy, not replace it, but really strengthen it and help, politician, help guide the um, route that politicians should uh, pursue. So thank you. Hopefully that was interesting. <laughs> Thanks so much, Andrea. So, Hey Young is going to talk to us about uh, the work she's done in South Korea. Yes. I'll bend down again. Thank you. Okay. Hello. <laughs> uh, my name is Hey Young, and I came from South Korea. And I got a question about uh, which part, which part of South, uh, Korea did you come, <laughs> uh, north or south? I know you guys. Are, uh, <laughs> No, north more than south, but I came from South Korea, unfortunately. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, um, uh -oh. because my English is not perfect, so I would like to see my script. So I came from Wagle Foundation, and I have worked uh, there for six months. So I can talk about what we are doing, and I will. But I would like to have more uh, talk about the context we are working. Yeah, not only just the project we are doing. Actually, I don't know <laughs> uh, uh, if my leader knows this. Then maybe she will kill me. But uh, she cannot kill kill me because it's democracy. So <laughs> yeah, they, she cannot. So before, before I start my story, I would like to tell you one thing. Uh, I knew this conference is for a democracy and also the citizen participation and the actions and platform system for supporting the democracy. But uh, Council Con, I would like to say, sadly, uh, somehow failed to host me as a citizen because I will tell you, I came here with my younger sister over there and, um, and my friend uh, because uh, she has an uh, autism uh, developmental disability. So we live together, but unfortunately, we don't have a good support system for disabled people in my country. So I have to be with her always, or my friend supposed to be with her. So uh, when I got the email from this council com, uh, about the flight ticket, so I uh, asked about the ticket for her. Uh, can you support or not? Uh, so I waited answer, but I got the worst answer. That was not no. The, there, there was no answer. But the core of the uh, civil participation, citizen participation, is a feedback. So <laughs> no answer is the worst answer. So uh, I hope this would not happen again. <laughs> yes, and then I would like to start. So, uh, for the citizens of South Korea, the democ democracy of South Korea was born in 19, uh, 1987. And then uh, in that year, another thing was born, and that is me. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm the children of democracy in my society. <laughs> But uh, our, min uh, our democracy was died in, at the same moment of its born because so many people in South Korea believe that democracy is just like the direct election of president. <laughs> so because we achieved it, so uh, it's done. So <laughs> our democracy was done. So in that result, even though I was born uh, with the democracy of our society, but I knew the fact we have 300 members of our National Assembly uh, only before, like three years ago. <laughs> yeah, I knew that just in three years ago. So that's the, that is the present address of Korean society and our democracy. But the, cha the change I am experiencing is the change of our um, democracies change. So Korean society ex have experienced a really long dictatorship 
And finally, we got democratized, which means the direct election synthesis of uh, president. But people's mind didn't change a lot, so we uh, have elected many strange ones. <laughs> so our previous one, our previous president was a daughter of the dictator, sadly. So when she was a president in 2006, so there was a ship going to an island, beautiful island in South Korea, and there was about 500 people, including the high school students, going to field trip, and it sank, and 300 people died. So the government failed to rescue them. So at the moment, we finally realized something got wrong. So uh, citizens of our society, my society, uh, decided to do something we've never done. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, that is, uh, we brought our candles to the square uh, in every like Saturday and Sunday uh, for 23 weeks. And our population is 50 million, and among them, 17 million came to the uh, square, and we asked to the parliament to impeach our president, and finally we succeeded. So that's why we have new president since last year. So our mission about uh, okay, I forgot to do this. Okay, hello world. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, my foundation Waggle, which means we all govern lab, and uh, our mission is better democracy by ordinary people. In South Korea, we have really, really strong elitism. So people think elites governs, not us. But we think we have more ideas and more participation of citizens. And because the citizen participation became kind of trend in South Korea, so politicians using that uh, word uh, as a fashion. So uh, they gathered opinions from the, the citizens, but they just listen. Listen, that is the achievement of participation. No more, no more rules, no more stages, and no more procedures, no more promises. So that's why we made this platform, Kuke Tok Tok, which means we are knocking the door of uh, National Assembly. This is very simple uh, online platform. It has three steps, making proposal, and uh, you gather people's agreement. So and if you gather, uh, 1,000 people's agreement, then uh, we match, we find the proper committee and proper member of the National Assembly to uh, achieve that proposal. So this is very simple uh, form to make proposal, like you can uh, write your title and you can write your content as, as whatever you want and you summarize that and you can attach image or not, okay. So, We've been uh, running this platform for two years, and for two years we got 558 proposers from the people, and among them, 23 uh, got achieved the uh, 100, more than uh, 1,000 people's agreement. So two of them matched and became laws, and seven of them are still uh, working, uh, like making bills and campaigns. And uh, before our platform, there was a kind of petition for the parliament, but uh, for like four years, they got only the half of the number of uh, our platform. So uh, we see our uh, numbers, quite, it's quite uh, significant. But um, uh, sadly, but actually not that much sad, uh, the projects and proposers we got from our citizens are quite messy, really messy, uh, sometimes uh, really dangerous. But, yes, dangerous like my English. But I am <laughs> very proud of my English because it means I am not elite, I'm just ordinary people from South Korea and our uh, public education is not really good. <laughs> so, yeah, this is very natural. But I'm still learning and I think my English is kind of symbol of uh, can be kind of symbol of my uh, country's democracy, because people don't, people are not good at this language, democracy language, but they are learning for a better future for themselves. So uh, even though it's messy, but I think it's really 
better thing to do something on the open and transparent platform and doing something for the society uh, rather than the decide everything in the darkest closet of elites. So there are good ideas and bad ideas. We can make a world better or maybe not. <laughs> but I think the most important thing is to know we have our uh, power in our hand and we can define the democracy in many ways. But for our um, foundation, uh, the democracy is feeling responsibility about this messy world. <laughs> yes. Uh, Yes, uh, so I will finish. So uh, the impact our platform uh, gave to our society is uh, people started to know the idea. We ha it's really natural to have um, yeah, open and transparent so you can know how it will go if you reach some kind of criteria. So uh, it made a big... Uh-oh. There is no... One slide. Okay, so we have another big petition uh, website on, in our country, and that is the hottest website in uh, my country. Not Google, not YouTube, but this is very hot. It's a petition website run by the government, the Blue House. Blue House is the uh, White House in Korea. So, <laughs> yes, uh, so people gather to the platform and they uh, upload their opinions and proposals and uh, lawmaking ideas and people vote. There was no criteria about the next stage, but because people demanded, so they made the new criteria. It's so they, uh, if you gather uh, 200,000 people about your proposal, then the president or the ministry or the person in charge will answer in video. So that's our, uh, that's our system and sorry for passing up my time. Thank you. Uh, so I want to I want to acknowledge and thank you for sharing this reminder that um, participation is hard work, and in order for it to be successful, it really has to be accessible for everyone. Um, and I also want to share this reflection that I think is really um, helpful. That there's two examples of participation processes here that focus on underrepresented communities. If we think of students as not typically having a voice. Um, communities that have high percentage of immigrant and migrant populations not typically having the same voice. And one of them is digital and one of them is not. And here we have two examples of input on uh, policy and the direction of a government and one of them is digital and one of them is not. Um, so just with that, I wanted to ask one question. I know we don't have a lot of time, but the question I would ask is, uh, what's one thing you've learned from doing this that you think would be useful for folks in this room who might be considering what participation process is appropriate for their context? What have you learned or what's one impact you wanna lift up? I can start, I guess. Um, so, uh, I think you really have to know what you want to be the outcome in some ways as to whether you choose to have something like a citizens assembly which is going to make recommendations for policy or whether you're going to run something more along the lines of a petition site or um, have people decide about the local area in which they work in. Each participative process is very unique I think to the uh, policy and issue that you're trying to um, deal with. So being clear on what you want to achieve via participation, I think is a really um, important thing to uh, get clear before diving into um, a process which uh, might not deliver what you promise or what people expect of the process either. But try. <laughs> bueno, um, He dicho antes que, no sé si lo he dicho, mi centro es un centro público también, ¿no? Ella ha dicho que había estudiado en un centro público, pero no, mi centro es un centro público. Y aunque vivimos en un país democrático, nos pasa un poco que pretendemos hacer como una ilustración, ¿no? Todo para el pueblo, pero sin el pueblo. Todo para los estudiantes, pero sin contar con ellos. Realmente ha habido épocas mejores en las que la representación estudiantil era mucho más alta en los centros. Ahora no sabemos por qué. Esto ha tenido un gran bajón, no sé si es porque pasan o no, pero, pero se, se, hasta ahora se preocupaban pocos por participar. ¿no? Entonces, eh, descubrir esta herramienta 
nos hace ver que no siempre estamos en la verdad cuando creemos que lo que hacemos es siempre bueno para ellos. Realmente lo creemos. ¿eh? Entonces, eh, igual en un centro privado, con una cierta ideología y demás, estas cosas no, no son tan viables, pero en un centro público no solo son viables, sino que son altamente recomendables. Nuestra experiencia es muy buena y se las recomendamos a todos los centros escolares que puedan desarrollarla. What we have learned from our experiences, because we are in Berlin, we are always talking about how to reach target groups, that there, are, there, that there is not such a thing uh, like how to reach target groups. It always depends on your methods. If you use academic methods, you only, use, you only uh, reach academic people. If you use really day-to-day -day interaction, you suddenly reach people normally everybody would think about they are very hard to reach and no, then they show up and you see how many people can get involved in uh, local democracy, local projects and so on. Quite recently we have just started because it's a very young uh, neighborhood and we have started with elderly people who were complaining that there are no services for them and we included them in the neighborhood council, they decided on a project and they now want to steer really this project and they want to choose who's, uh, who's doing this project. So. You, you just have to try it and you have to overcome barriers and in some circumstances you have to wait for the right time to come. So for me, the, the, the process of a Kuka Tok Tok uh, let me know that uh, democracy is not a kind of event. It's about more dialogue and conversation and communication and circulating co uh, uh, conversation. So uh, I get used to see uh, people get disappointed <laughs> when they have the result they didn't expect it. Yeah, they get really depressed and uh, disappointed. <laughs> but I got used to. And maybe I think that's the right emotion for democracy somehow. Because even though we feel really uh, blue and bad, uh, feelings but anyway we can go on and we can find another direction we can find another action and we can keep our conversation uh, not by violence but by any uh, skills for democracies I think we have time for maybe one or two questions if someone here has something burning Sana Hi, uh, thank you for a really interesting panel. Um, so I was wondering, um, Thomas, um, how you, what kind of funding you have for the different citizens funds. I didn't really understand that, like what the money come from. And then also, um, um, I don't remember, remember your name, sorry, from South Korea. Uh, the two laws that passed, I'm just curious what laws they were. And I'm going to actually throw the funding question to everyone. How do we fund this work? <laughs> um, the main funding comes from the European Regional Development Fund for the huge building projects. The other money comes uh, to a small proportion from a federal state program called Social City. And the main part comes from the uh, city of Berlin. But to make a lot of projects uh, happen, we need a lot of other resources. So our job is to find other fi financing resources to making, for example, a project in a school happen or something else in the neighborhood. So we have a lot of different funding schemes for the projects, but the main funding we are deciding on, on like you, if you like, by the neighborhood council, this comes from this federal state program which is mainly financed by the city of Berlin.
participants, one of the uh, projects was about reducing the hospital bill for children, and another was uh, guaranteeing annual paid leave for new employees. So it's all passed, and our foundation is basically funded by citizens, yeah, not by government or not by any uh, institutions. Um, in relation to funding, the Brexit assembly was a kind of research funding, so it was through research, it was a research project um, largely led by K uh, King's College, and so we were part of that, but um, that's where they got that funding from. And uh, we run other processes, uh, one with Parliament actually, which even Parliament wasn't able to provide all the money <laughs> for the process. Um, it had a very, very limited budget for citizen participation, and um, we had to get funding from grant funders, foundations, things like that. So in the UK, definitely, it's very, very complicated and very difficult to find the funding, especially as Thomas actually mentioned earlier. Um, we've there's cuts and cuts and cuts to spending. Um, and at the local level, it's been completely decimated. So funding at the local level is even harder than it is um, at the national or uh, in parliament um, in those, those levels. Bien, nuestro presupuesto es mucho más... No necesitamos tanto presupuesto para hacer algo como lo que hemos hecho, pero en Euskadi, en el País Vasco, eh, los centros eh, escolares públicos tienen una cierta autonomía, una cierta autonomía económica, hay una dotación dos veces al año y de alguna forma el, el equipo directivo junto con, el, con, los, con las familias y con los alumnos en el consejo escolar deciden que gastarlo. Entonces, eh, una vez que planteamos este proyecto dentro del plan anual, eh, hemos logrado la financiación, sí que nos ha hecho falta dinero, por ejemplo, pues no, no contábamos dentro del, del propio instituto, dentro del propio centro, con un informático que pudiese ponernos en, forma, en, en marcha la plataforma y lo hemos tenido que contratar de forma externa. Y entonces, bueno, pues simplemente de los fondos que nos proporciona el propio gobierno vasco. Someone here tell me if we have more time or if we're out of time? I think we're at the end. Okay, I don't want to keep you from cocktails. It's the very end of the day. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you to the panelists. Please give them a round of applause.